upon my entrance, Usher arose from a sofa on which she had been lying at full length, and greeted me with a vivacious warmth which had much in it. I at first thought of an overdone cordiality, of the constrained effort of the ennuyé man of the world. A glance, however, at his countenance convinced me of his perfect sincerity. We sat down, and for some moments while he spoke not, I gazed upon him with a feeling half of pity, half of awe. Surely man had never before so terribly altered in so brief a period as had Roderick Usher. It was with difficulty that I could bring myself to admit the identity of the wan being before me with the companion of my early boyhood. Yet the character of his face had been at all times remarkable. A cadaverousness of complexion an eye large, liquid, and luminous beyond comparison, lips somewhat thin and very pallid, but of a surprisingly beautiful curve, a nose of a delicate Hebrew model, but with a breadth of nostril unusual in similar formations, a finely molded chin speaking in its want of prominence of a want of moral energy, hair of a more than web-like softness and tenuity, these features with an inordinate expansion above the regions of the temple made up altogether a countenance not easily to be forgotten, and now in the mere exaggeration of the prevailing character of these features and of the expansion they were wont to convey lay so much of change that I doubted to whom I spoke. The now ghastly pallor of skin and the now miraculous luster of the eye above all things startled even awed me. The silken hair, too, had been suffered to grow all unheeded, and as in its wild gossamer texture it floated rather than fell about the face, I could not, even with effort, connect its arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity.